Good afternoon, everybody. I am Jill Morris, British Ambassador to Italy, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all today to our webinar on youth engagement with climate negotiations. Um, and we are very grateful to the NL Foundation for collaborating with us on today's event. This is a landmark year for climate and the environment. This year, the UK holds the COP26 partnership, uh, presidency in partnership with Italy. COP26 is the 26th United Nations Climate Conference. And COP26 will be the most important climate summit since the landmark Paris Agreement was agreed at COP21 in 2015. So we hope that this will be the next big moment at which nations come together to renew, review commitments, but also to strengthen the ambition to tackle climate change most notably limiting the global temperature rise to well below two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees centigrade. And we strongly believe that to address the devastating consequences of climate change, we have to accelerate. We have to accelerate dramatically the transition to clean and sustainable growth. And following the pandemic, following COVID-19, we have a responsibility to build back better in a way that is greener and more sustainable than ever before. before. And our partnership with Italy will focus on promoting tangible, concrete action that brings to life the transformational change that's required to unlock the full potential of uh, the Paris Agreement and to champion the need for urgent climate action. But this change is only possible if we all are part of it and we all have a role to play. Now, if you're listening to this webinar today, you may be at school or at university at the beginning of your career or seeking a career path. Wherever you are and whatever stage you're at, you will be living in a world that is defined by the actions that we take this year and beyond. And as members of the next generation, you have been and you are important drivers of this change through your activism, through expressing your rightful concerns and making your voices heard. You, the next generation, will play a very important role this year, especially at the Youth Summit, the Youth COP Summit that will be hosted in Milan in this September, during which you will have the chance to make your voices heard on climate change. So this webinar that we're hosting uh, today in collaboration with the NL Foundation is aimed precisely at raising awareness about what COP26 is, what is the pre-COP, what is the Youth Summit, uh, what's, uh, what's it all about, what does it mean for you and how can you make your voices heard. And I'm delighted to be here today with Dr. Papa, the Managing Director of the NL Foundation, who I'm delighted now to hand over the, the floor to before introducing the other panelists. Carla, grazie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for, uh, for staying with us today. We know you have a very complicated schedule, but we know your tremendous effort, both personally and with the British authority to making Glasgow a real success. Now, uh, we, if we know a little bit the history of Glasgow, it's going to be probably less glamour than Paris, but in the name of Glasgow, we have already the element of green, because in Gaelic, uh, we have, we have uh, in the name that is already green. So I want to just tell you, our audience, that our cooperation with Mr. Brocchieri was uh, started uh, across uh, the UN headquarters in 2019. And since then, uh, we have come to realize uh, three essential elements that you were recalling. The first is the fragility of our system, and in this, the COVID has been uh, a tremendous wake-up call. The second is the urgency to take climate change seriously. Unfortunately, we were all busy with vaccines and understanding how the COVID was going, but in the first week uh, of 2021, uh, right two weeks ago, 
the 2020 was declared as the hottest year in the entire Europe, confirming that trajectory we are having is not essentially good for our futures and especially for our youth. And third, the fact that we are all here with tremendous audience and outstanding guests give me the possibility to remember that we all need to come together Otherwise, we will not win uh, this, uh, this uh, big fa uh, fight and we need to find solutions to preserve our planet boundaries and ensure, and ensure a safe, safe space for all. So I welcome to be here again with the British government, with you personally, with all our guests and audience, and uh, I welcome uh, to open new way and possibility of cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Carlo. So let's move now then to our first panel. And to start, um, uh, I'm very pleased that we have with us um, Presidente Crisostomo, um, uh, Presidente of Enel. Um, Presidente, you've written the, the preface of the book by Federico Brocchieri on climate um, negotiations. And can you tell us why is COP26 important to Enel? Well, first of all, thanks a lot to you know, Madam Ambassador Morris and uh, Carlo Papa for organizing this event. And uh, really, I appreciate uh, the approach, which is involving uh, uh, youth in uh, uh, sharing uh, the possibility of interacting, uh, of uh, um, moving from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, in a way, activism to contribution to a concrete negotiation table with the perspective of sharing uh, the values of the uh, fighting against the climate change, which is uh, now, I think, uh, very well rooted into the mind, into the culture of the new generations. So what I think is that you, I think, uh, Madam Ambassador, you correctly pointed out that this uh, COP26 is going to be a sort of uh, um, an event with uh, the same or at least uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with an importance uh, in the development of the, the whole uh, discussions uh, among nations uh, uh, around the fighting against the climate change, uh, as it was uh, the, uh, the, the meeting that led to the uh, Paris Agreement. And uh, I tend to agree with you for a number of reasons. The first one is that uh, we have seen in the meantime really growing the involvement of the uh, new generations into any discussions relating to climate change. This has become really a driver for uh, all, uh, all uh, the uh, activism in the perspective of, uh, a, a, in a way, creating the possibility of a better world, of a world where it is uh, possible to live uh, in a clearer environment uh, with low emissions and with the possibility of inclusion of everybody in terms of accessing uh, uh, essential you know, services like electricity, for instance. You know, we know that uh, the uh, electricity divide, the possibility of everybody to access uh, in an affordable way you know, clean energy is one of the SDGs, but this is a, an essential, in a way, assumption, an essential uh, you know, um, ground for any you know, fighting against inequalities, hmm? which is, again, one of those aspects where, regardless of any, you know, ideological you know, background, uh, young generations are really looking at as a sort of a simple goal, you know, let's remove inequalities. Let's try to be uh, creating conditions for a, a better world, which is, again, as I said, cleaner. And in this respect, the pandemia has uh, uh, to a certain extent uh, shown us what the future can be, you know, because uh, we have uh, understood how it is possible to uh, be connected without being uh, socially close. So we are socially distanced, you know, but at the same time we are all connected. And uh, uh, I think that new generations have been uh, appreciating uh, uh, probably before, you know, older generations, uh, how the new technological means uh, can be used to spread values. And the fighting against climate change is something which, if you go on uh, social networks, if you go through the internet, you can see it is really where youngest people are really looking at. And it's our responsibility to make them, first of all, being part of these discussions. And that's the reason why I've been uh, really been happy to, 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 to write the 
the, the preface to the uh, Mr. Brocheri's uh, book, because it's a, a sign of attention to a new world, a new generation, which is uh, helping us to build the future for them. Mm? That's, I think, is really the key. And in this connection, I think the COP26 uh, in Glasgow will be definitely a key event, which is, by the way, also um, interjecting uh, one of the theme of our G20 this year. I know that, as you know, Italy is, uh, is, uh, is uh, as the presidency. Um, you know that you know, the three words, the three pillars of the G20 are people, planet, prosperity. And uh, in this connection, uh, all the discussions around sustainability that we are seeing in the context of G the, the G G20 will be definitely looking at the SDGs, at the fighting against the climate change. You know, SDG 13 is the pillar, in a way, around which all the others can be definitely, uh, in a way, converging. You know, in terms of uh, we are doing this because at the, at the end of the chain, or at the end of the chain, there will be some uh, step forward against uh, again the climate change. But again, all of these uh, uh, will be um, with the COP26 uh, uh, really something that will be nurturing a debate which today is mature to give the world, I think, uh, a new future, to give the world uh, new policies, to give the world uh, some uh, new vision where probably people at all levels are starting to believe that it is possible to get there. You know? So we are in a moment where, again, also because of the pandemia, I can't say thanks to the pandemia, but because of the pandemia, we are experiencing a really something that maybe can happen really once in the history, a convergence of politicians, of uh, uh, activists, of, uh, um, you know, in a way, uh, public statement, private companies, uh, investors, you know, we have seen also, I don't know, Larry Fink's type of uh, statements by private investors, all going towards the same direction. In this connection, I think, first of all, we are in very good hands in the negotiation on the COP26 with the Ms. Fricano and Mr. Davis, for sure. And uh, we believe that, uh, you know, we have high expectations respect to the outcome of this COP26 because of, what we, of you know, what we have said. And as far as Enel is concerned, uh, you know, I can guarantee that we will be doing really our best to protect your and our right to a sustainable future. And as long as, you know, uh, your generation nurtures, you know, this genuine interest on in the climate question, going beyond the activism and be part of the solution, contributing to the negotiation, you know, you show us that we can really act as a planet, you know, as a condominium rather than as individual flats, other than, than uh, competing nations. So thank you and uh... thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Presidente. And you made an important point there about the role of the G20. Um, and another important element of our bilateral relationship this year is that, of course, the UK has the presidency of the G7 in this year of presidencies. So we are working very closely with our Italian colleagues to make sure that the Italian G20 agenda and the British G7 uh, agenda um, that both support the goals of COP26 um, this year, with climate being um, the defining theme. Thank you very much indeed, um, Presidente. And now let's turn to COP26 itself. Um, what is it? What happens there? What's the role of a negotiator? And to kick off to explain this to us, I'm delighted that we have with us today Hugh Davis, who is the British Deputy Negotiator for COP26. Um, Hugh, can you shine some light um, for us? Take us behind the scenes in COP um, and what will happen. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Ambassador. Thank you, Jill. Um, yeah, I will do my best. Um, so, yeah, my name is Hugh Davis. I'm the Deputy Lead Negotiator for COP26. Uh, I've been working on COPs and, and the UNFCCC, which is the framework which uh, the COP operates under uh, for about five years. And I'm very proud that I was I was the head of the Foreign Ministry's team 
that helped our French colleagues to deliver the Paris Agreement. Um, and this has been a kind of key area of my life over the last few years. So it's really, um, it's, it's great to be here today and, and have the opportunity to talk about what we do in, in, in this world of COPs. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak a bit about it, but I, I'm going to sort of put it Back to basics and if I um, am a bit too simple in how I explain this I apologize but I think one of the lessons we always learn in the negotiations is that one of the crucial things is that we start with the same basis of understanding um, so what I'm going to set out is as I say in quite simple terms um, but as we come to the the, the later panel and q and I'm sure we can delve into more detail um, if that helps essentially what a COP is it's, it's an opportunity for all or pretty much all countries around the world to come together and work out how to tackle climate change. Um, as you know, climate change, it can't be addressed by just one country or one city or one region. Uh, our planet doesn't respect that. The ecosystems, they work on a global scale. And so we need every country to do its bit. And that's why we need COPs. We need the UN system um, to bring this together in a, in a, in a structured way. Um, and that falls under, as I say, something called the, the UNFCCC, um, which is the particular a part of the UN that brings countries together on an annual basis uh, through the COPs to agree what we, we need to do to take things forward. Um, as has been alluded to, the next one is COP26. Uh, it will be the 1st to the 12th of November this year and in, it will be in Glasgow. Uh, I like to think, but I'm biased, that it will be uh, more glamorous than Paris. Uh, Paris was in uh, was in a, uh, an air, air, air uh, field outside Paris. Uh, this will be very much in the centre of uh, one, a great city of culture. And so we look forward to welcoming you there uh, later in the year. Uh, in terms of our goals for the COP, um, I think, to, to put it in simple terms, we're making progress through the platform of the presidency this year, but also through what we'll negotiate with all countries in Glasgow uh, and what we'll decide there on four different areas. Uh, one of which is how we mitigate against climate change, that's the word we use, which is basically how we reduce emissions um, and all countries we're pushing to come forward uh, with enhanced commitments uh, as to how they're going to do that. Uh, the UK tried to lead by the front with our commitment last uh, October, um, which really put a high bar on what we expect other countries to do and the, the EU did exactly the same, so we were great, great to see Italy and our other friends in the EU doing that as well. Um, secondly, we want to help make sure that the most vulnerable can adapt to the impact of climate change. Um, climate change is happening already. We need to acknowledge that and we need to acknowledge that many countries need support in, in addressing that. Um, so that's one of our other main focuses. And to help with both of those different elements, we also want to make sure that the finance is there, uh, that the money is there needed to adapt and needed to change economies uh, going forward. And the last of our four areas is on cooperation, um, because we know that this can't be done by governments alone. This needs to be done by regions, cities, businesses, um, and we have a number of different initiatives focusing on specific areas, such as electric vehicles, um, such as nature-based solutions, such as energy, uh, which will all form a part of how we tackle this together. Um, so again, it's mitigation, so how we reduce emissions, adaptation, how we help countries to adapt, finance, how we get the money to the right places to do that, and a, a platform for how we help everyone cooperate to do that together. Um, specifically in my area, which is the UNFCCC negotiations themselves, uh, one of the key things we need to do in Glasgow is agree the final pieces of how we will implement the Paris Agreement. The, in Paris, we agreed the principles, we agreed the headlines of what we needed to achieve, but we didn't agree the nuts and bolts, the details of how we would deliver that. And so that's what we've been doing over the last few years to make sure that there's a solid foundation, a system that we can use in the years and decades to come as we uh, as we tackle this problem, which we can't do in a day, um, but will take, uh, take several years. Um, and so that's one of the main things that we're looking to try and achieve. In terms of my role and, and my opposite numbers role, I, it's quite simple in a way for, for negotiators, they're trying to achieve uh, the best outcome for their particular country's interests and then at the right time make a judgment on when they need to compromise because can't, everyone can't get everything they want. Um, there will be differences of opinion between countries. So it's the responsibility of a negotiator not only to get what's best for their government and the people in their country, but also what's best for the, for the, for the greater good uh, and when they need to make a compromise. As a 
presidency, my role is to make sure that I can bring countries together in the right way at the right time, help them to share their views with each other um, and share their views with us so that we can help to find compromises and solutions that bring everyone together. Um, and those need to be compromises in the right areas. What we don't want is too much compromise. So we end up with a, a low ambition result, which is not good for anyone. Um, so last of all, um, I think, as I said, we need partnerships to deliver this. Uh, and part of what I said as a presidency, we need to broker those conversations, but we can't do those al that alone. So we need, we need partners to do that. And one of our key partners is Italy. So it's great to be working together this year. As Jill said, it's the year that we're, we're, we're chairing the G7 and the G20 together. So it really is a kind of landmark historic moment where we've got a great opportunity to bring all these different tracks together and achieve a huge amount this year. Um, and so it's, it's, great opportunity, uh, great privilege to be working with friends and colleagues in Italy on this as well. Um, before I close, just to circle back to, to what COP is, I've been involved in a lot of international work, a lot of negotiations over the years. And for me, what COP is, it, it, it's really inspiring. What you, what you get when you go there is you get a lot of people focused on achieving the same thing, who are really dedicated to this cause. Um, so the only other way I would add to the description of the kind of what you read in textbooks is it really is a, a lightning rod for hope. Uh, and what, that's what I hope that we can provide in Glasgow this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Hugh, and for ending on that positive, uh, optimistic note. Um, and Hugh also talked about the importance of our partnership with Italy. And now we're going to hear from one of our close Italian collaborators, Dr. SFM Federica Fricano. Dear all, um, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me to this, uh, to this meeting. And I want also to apologize for not being able to join you um, live. But unfortunately, um, there, is, there was also another meeting under the, G, under the G20 um, uh, process that we, are, uh, that we are following. But I didn't want to miss uh, this opportunity to highlight how important it is this year also for, for Italy in a, in, a, in a certain sense, but in, in the, for the international community um, as a whole for the, for the global fight against uh, climate change. As you know, from, um, from December 2020, from the 1st December of 2020, we have taken the presidency of the G20 for the first time in, in, in history. Um, which is an important uh, responsibility in a crucial historical moment um, with countries that are taxed to act rapidly to build more uh, sustainable, inclusive and uh, resilient uh, world. 2021, um, uh, the international community will be called to undertake ambition action to, with, uh, to win the global, change, global challenge in, um, we are all facing from the pandemic to climate change, from the fight against poverty and inequality to, to the support of innovation. Therefore, the G20 um, will hold a key role in delivering green, uh, concrete and effective response, um, uh, for in which uh, um, Italy um, has built um, its priority. Um, as you know, that uh, follow three main pillars, uh, which are people, planet and, uh, and prosperity. Um, it is therefore clear that climate change is very high in, uh, in our agenda um, and you also recognize uh, the importance uh, of uh, the multilateral negotiation under the UNF triple C. Um, this year, again, uh, in light of the of the partnership that we have with our friend uh, from the from the UK for the presidency of COP26, we also will host the, um, an event in Milan, which is the pre-COP26, uh, which is an informal uh, an informal event, which um, uh, will contribute uh, in preparing the basis for unlocking uh, the key challenge for what. Uh, we trust uh, we will be an ambitious outcome in, uh, in, in Glasgow. Uh, moreover, we will also host the Youth for Climate Driving Ambition event, uh, which will offer an unprecedented opportunity for, uh, for the young people to advance concrete uh, proposal and engage directly with the minister attending also the, uh, the, the pre-COP. 
Um, in the past few years, young people have proved uh, to be not only a great source of inspiration, but also key actors to involve, to contribute to shaping the vision of more sustainable future. Um, and therefore, we uh, deem it very important to organize this meeting and involve them in the discussion that we will conclude at COP26 in, in Glasgow. In the following week, um, a global call for application will be launched to select the young uh, participants from around the world, and uh, we will support um, their participation at the event in, uh, in, in Milan. We are working with our partnership uh, partner from the, from the UK and uh, several other actors in an advisory committee, which will help uh, the, um, the management and the, and the functioning of the, of the Youth for Climate uh, uh, Driving Ambition. In parallel also to this process, uh, last December, we have also launched the All for Climate Italy 2021, which is a campaign uh, which will enable uh, public and private actors as well as uh, NGOs to share their ideas, their project uh, proposal around matters related to climate change and the implementation of the Paris Agreement, that uh, all issues that we will discuss uh, in, uh, in Milan. I'm sure that this virtual event will contribute to highlighting the importance of climate negotiation, as well as the crucial role of young people in raising awareness among future generations. I'm very happy that um, our colleague, friend Federico, will present his book that I, 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 I personally find very, uh, very important and very, and very, and very exciting. Federico has been working uh, with us um, since some time, so, and uh, it's uh, it's really um, a, a, a precious component of our uh, of our uh, of our delegation. So thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you all the best for the for the rest of the of the meeting. Bye bye. Our thanks to you. Our thanks to um, Federica. And now we are going to turn to our second um, panel for this webinar starting with a presentation of the book that we've already mentioned by Federico Brocchieri on climate negotiations, and then followed by a round table with um, our excellent experts that we have with us today, Antonio Navarra, President of the Euro Mediterranean Centre on Climate Change, Rob Stavins, Professor of Energy and Economic Development at Harvard, and Nisreen Elaim, the UN's Youth Advisory Group on climate change. Very grateful to them and to our previous speakers for being with us today and to all of you for joining us. Um, do enjoy the, um, the second panel and of course the opportunity to ask questions. And now I will hand over to Gabriele um, to moderate the rest of the webinar. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Jill. Good afternoon, everybody. Jill, thanks for having me. And uh, I was waiting for your cat to come into view. Uh, unfortunately, I don't. So I'm, uh, I think uh, <laughs> I will turn 30 on February the 12th. And so I think I can define myself as a part of uh, that youth involved in this debate. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. So I'm happy to introduce you uh, Federico Brocchieri, which is a climate negotiation, negotiation expert and, and the author of the book I Negoziati sul Clima, which is uh, the negotiation on climate. Uh, thank you, Federico, for being with us. So uh, Federico, let's talk about uh, negotiations. Uh, in your book, you explain how the process uh, can uh, be from a top-down approach to a bottom-up one. So could you elaborate this uh, issue, please? For sure. Thank you very much. And first of all, um, uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, let me start by thanking Madam Ambassador Morris and uh, Director Papa for hosting this event that I'm very, very pleased to attend. Uh, let me also uh, express my gratitude to NL's Chairman Dr. Chris Ostomo for accepting to sharing his view uh, towards uh, the challenges that the, our generation and the world are going and to face and um, and also uh, to uh, NL Foundation and uh, Dr. Papa for embracing this project about the book and uh, uh, providing uh, a, a, a very important and relevant help uh, to turn it into reality. And uh, and also finally, a, a huge thanks to Mr. Davis and Mr. Fricano for 
uh, outlining UK and Italy's priorities towards um, uh, what is uh, such a challenging uh, task in uh, such a, a complex period in 2021. Now, moving into uh, into the matters, of course, there is, uh, the climate negotiations, as uh, it was anticipated, is a very complex process. Uh, there's been a, a change in the way negotiations have been conducted somehow in, in the past few years. So we used to have a, in the early 2000s um, an approach that was more uh, structured uh, uh, as an, in the form of a top-down approach. And uh, this, thing, this uh, approach has changed gradually over time and perhaps after uh, COP15 in Copenhagen in 2009 and with the uh, adoption of the Durban platform in 2011, a new course of this process has started uh, leading to the adoption of the Paris Agreement, which is uh, the result of a bottom-up approach where uh, generally the rules are applicable to all countries uh, with, uh, of course, specific uh, flexibilities to, to those developing countries uh, who need it in light of their capacities. So um, in this sense, of course, uh, uh, the negotiations have evolved and, uh, and this has happened because of the result of many uh, different uh, elements that need to be taken into account. On the one hand, uh, we have some uh, principles to, to respect and to implement into this process and into the agreements that are adopted. But uh, on the other hand, we uh, have the scientific community outlining very clearly that we need uh, to cut emissions drastically, in, uh, especially starting by this decade and, of course, in the, in the coming years. So uh, the result of this was uh, the approach that was, uh, um, uh, that was able to deliver the Paris Agreement, which is a, a very uh, important outcome, but as it was anticipated, needs to be finalized uh, and be implemented over the next few years. Thank you, Federico. So uh, what for uh, action, for youth action? So uh, from protests uh, along the uh, last year's two action, looking at COP26, which is the agenda for youth, in your opinion? Well, le le let's say this. Um, young people have clearly understood the importance of uh, uh, developing uh, a low carbon future, uh, not only for their own life, but for the generation that are yet to come. And uh, this is probably one of the reasons why they've decided to take action so vigorously, in, uh, especially in 2019. And then this was somehow uh, slowed down in, in 2020 due to the pandemic. Uh, but one point that I want to emphasize is that uh, while uh, youth engagement around this matter has always been framed around activism, uh, young people are also um, very capable and, uh, and they, they in fact were on the front line in uh, promoting concrete and practical solutions on these matters as well. Uh, there is one um, episode that I always like to, to mention that uh, um, in the lead up to uh, COP21 in 2015, when I was still attending this process as uh, an observer, as part of civil society, uh, a group of young people have worked and uh, dedicated a lot of their free time in uh, the three years uh, leading up to COP21 to promote and uh, uh, push for the principle of intergenerational equity uh, within the climate negotiations. It was a quite challenging uh, pathway, but uh, after engaging with parties and uh, promoting uh, ideas and concrete textual proposals, in the end, also because of their uh, support and their efforts, uh, the principle was embodied in the preamble of the Paris Agreement. So I think this is a, a, a very good example that uh, there are a number of um, achievements that are within reach of young people and, uh, and that should represent a source of inspiration for many of them, also in the lead up to uh, COP26, which will, uh, of course, benefit from the support that young people will be able to bring to create the momentum needed to uh, support countries in the adoption of uh, ambitious outcomes. Oh, okay. Uh, you, you you told us about uh, the momentum. What about the decision by the U.S. President uh, Joe Biden to rejoin the uh, Paris Agreement uh, as uh, one of the first uh, um, actions in uh, in the White House? Well, I, I think this definitely uh, is, a, is, a, is a positive element uh, to look at. Um, uh, you know, in, on the one hand, we... Um, uh, 
we were all said that the COP26 and all uh, related preparatory events were postponed to 2021 because of the pandemics, because we this somehow uh, delayed the process a little bit, uh, although work continued uh, during 2020 and in these months uh, virtually, so the, 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 the discussions did not stop. But on the other hand, of course, the fact that the, um, the new president has decided and, and has officially submitted the instrument to join the Paris Agreement again offers an opportunity to have uh, the participation of the United States to the session of the Paris Agreement uh, during COP20, during COP26. So this is, uh, I think, a positive development uh, to look at. And, uh, and of course, this could also contribute building a, uh, an even more uh, positive environment for the adoption of uh, uh, ambitious outcomes in Glasgow. Thank you, Federico. Thank you. So let's turn to the round table. Uh, so um, I'm happy to introduce you Antonio Navarra, which is professor at the University of Bologna and president of the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Ro to you. Robert Stavins. Thank you. Robert Stavins, which is AJ Mayer Professor of Energy and Economic Development at the Harvard Kennedy School. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And Nazreen El Saim, which is Chair of the United Nations Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change. Good afternoon, Nazreen. Hi, everyone. Hi. So, uh, Professor Navarra, um, urgency and need are keywords when speaking about climate change. So, what the what can ro what the role can the science play and the youth people? Well, uh, you know, climate change is a problem that has an, an enormous science and technological base. And uh, I had the privilege of witnessing the transformation of climate change from a problem that was uh, an obscure problem in the science labs to a geopolitical issue of uh, uh, major importance. And so, in some sense, the content and the contribution of the science information is uh, crucial in the conversation. So, the scientific community has a large responsibility uh, of providing uh, information that are reliable, honest, accurate, and timely. Um, we cannot take forever to reach conclusions, so it's important that information arrives at the, at the, at the right time. On the other end, uh, the scientific community is also, has also responsibility in the role of um, mediator between uh, the technical arguments and the kind of uh, discussion and understanding of this issue in the more general societal debate. Uh, so we think, I think that we feel that very much and uh, uh, we are acutely aware that uh, uh, this is a very important uh, historical role that we have. On the other hand, it's important that uh, the science gets supported uh, in the right way. Uh, in some sense, it's big science. In some other sense, uh, it's uh, small science made by small groups. But uh, um, I have to say that uh, it is probably time that uh, we get the sort of support that's necessary to actually be able to provide information that I was referring before at the right time, the right place, to the right people. And the youth, of course, have a major role because uh, science is a young enterprise where old scientists have uh, a role, but is the enthusiasm and the passion and the creativity of the young generation that are the push towards new creation of content and ideas. So youth, the young people can have a major influence in the science community and in the societal community because uh, the future is theirs and uh, the, this issue is never more relevant to the young people that, uh, than ever. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Navarra. So, uh, Professor Stavis, uh, let's go back to the, the decision by the U.S. President Joe Biden to uh, rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement. So, uh, how could this affect, uh, how could this move affect the negotiation on climate? 
Well, as we've already heard, it, it has some significance to it, if for no other reason that the United States is the second largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. And in terms of the accumulated stock of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it's the largest contributor. So therefore, its participation, again, in the international negotiations is of great importance. And about 20 days from now, the United States will again become a party to the Paris Agreement. But for the President of the United States to have uh, submitted the instrument on Inauguration Day was the easy part. The hard part for the United States, which will be very important, is going to be coming up with a new nationally determined contribution. That's the crucial bottom-up aspect that we just heard about of the Paris Agreement, to come up with a new NDC that is at least as ambitious as the one that had been submitted by the Obama administration and probably more ambitious. And I say that because that's what will be necessary to satisfy domestic U.S. green organizations and to achieve satisfaction from major countries in the world, in particular from the European Union, which is on the path to a very ambitious uh, moves going forward. But in order to do that, what's going to probably be necessary is going to be a credible set of uh, tasks in the NDC. And though in order to be credible, they're going to have to involve policies that are either in place or can reasonably be anticipated to put in place in the United States. The only way to achieve those two necessary conditions is going to be with very ambitious domestic climate policy legislation from the Congress signed by the president. And I would like to condition expectations in that regard because it is going to be very difficult for reasons I won't take time to go into. And therefore, what we're likely to see from the U.S. are going to be a set of regulatory actions, executive orders, which have already begun, possibly some green tinting of an economic recovery package, and possibly some green tinting of a infrastructure policy. That said, uh, it's an important change. It was a very sad day when uh, the previous president of the United States announced his intention to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. And it was a happy day when the current president of the United States announced on Inauguration Day that he was intending to rejoin the Paris Agreement. Thank you, Professor. So, um, uh, Nazreen, we have a question from the public. So, uh, I take the opportunity to remember everyone. Um, please feel free to ask questions uh, uh, for our panelists using chats on LinkedIn, on Instagram, or also via social. So, uh, Nizreen, uh, Luca is asking, how? Uh, no, can you please share your experience as a prominent youth climate activist and climate negotiator? Um, thank you very much for this question. Um, first of all, I need to apologize for the darkness behind me. Um, we don't have electricity currently in Sudan, and this is becoming very um, much um, um, like uh, repeating uh, it, itself uh, event. Um, so very sorry for this. Um, well, earlier the chairman of the panel uh, talked about inequalities and how uh, many people are, were suffering from lack of electricity, especially in this hard of time of the COVID-19, where we, we can only meet uh, virtual. Um, well, it was uh, very ironic for me because the moment he was speaking about uh, lack of electricity access, our electricity went off. Um, so, first of all, thank you for having me here, and um, I really appreciate um, uh, this initiative from Enel, and I very much like the book. Um, well, um, I've been in the process of the climate change negotiations uh, since, uh, since uh, 2015, um, and um, I was a um, climate activist even before that, uh, but uh, of course the, the experience of the climate negotiations is totally different than anything else. Uh, I still remember my first COP when I had to just 
sit uh, in the first chair I found in the venue of the COP and just watch everyone walking around. I was so lost that uh, it was a very much a carnival for me. Uh, everyone was moving so fast, looking very pretty, wearing their <laughs> ties and shoes and suits and everything. Um, but it was uh, very hard to digest uh, the concepts from the first place and from the first time. Uh, but gradually, um, uh, started to attending some uh, negotiations, getting inside of the room, uh, following the lead negotiator of my country and also the African group of negotiators and so on. Um, uh, I understood um, the process and how it's happening. Uh, so I started negotiation, negotiating in gender and climate change and also in capacity building. And then uh, I moved into AIDS, which is uh, Action for Climate Empowerment. Uh, it's very important to highlight that young people consider AIDS, which is Article uh, 12 from the Paris Agreement, as their agenda item. So you, know, you will find many young people in the room watching the, the process of, uh, of the negotiation of the, uh, of the AIDS. And also, um, I'm very proud to say that um, I was part of the of the people who actually articulated the last the text of the AIDS, which actually mentioned young people inclusion um, within it. Um, last but not least, which is now what I'm doing for the last uh, two years, actually since Katowice, or three years if we count it this year, uh, I'm negotiating uh, with the African group of negotiators as a junior negotiator on uh, technology transfer. Uh, it was a very much uh, enriching um, experience for me, and it was very much much learning process and learning journey for me too. Um, the only thing I really regret that I didn't go much prepared. Um, and that's why since the last um, past um, last uh, three years, um, I was trying to establish a young negotiator program here in Sudan uh, to train young people on how to become <laughs> negotiators and be ready for the actual process uh, of the uh, COP and uh, also for the SBs. Because for example, me and my friends were counting um, and it was a job for, 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 for the both of us, but it in turn a, a very uh, true thing. We counted um, 277 acronyms in one session only uh, in the negotiation. So you can imagine how many acronyms uh, there existed within the UNFCCC um, C processes. And um, not mentioning the different subsidiary bodies and the different um, uh, uh, rules and the different. Uh, so, for example, when the first time I heard the uh, rule 16 inside of the negotiation room, I did not understand what those rule 16 mean. And uh, it took me a while to understand that there's other rules. Uh, if the countries did not agree on something, then they go to rule 16, which is no agreement. And then the process, um, the text goes goes up to the COP, and then the COP holds uh, some consultations, and everything is so. It's um, it's let me say, yes. Thank, thank you. I, I'd like to uh, to um, to invite uh, Professor Stevens and Professor Navala to join this discussion about the youth. So, uh, Professor Stevens, uh, as a professor, can you tell? Please, can you please tell us how students are dealing with those issues? Well, it's unquestionably the case that uh, students, young people in general, are much more interested in climate change. Uh, than are people of older generations. Um, given the fact that the costs of addressing climate change, taking policy actions are up front, and the benefits will be extended over a period of 50 years or more, green carbon dioxide with a half-life of the atmosphere over 100 years, it's not surprising that young people would be more aggressive, more ambitious on this topic than older people. The important question then, to which none of us know the answer, by the way, is whether or not this is an age effect or a cohort effect. In other words, as the current group of young people get older, will they become more conservative in this regard, as most people in life do, or is it instead a cohort effect? Will we see this same generation going forward re retaining their extreme ambitious ambition and climate activism? My guess, but I don't know the answer, is that there is some of both and that we will see that in the future, broadly in the population, we, there will be more support for aggressive climate policies. I mean, I've seen anecdotal evidence 
the my the enrollment in my class at Harvard on the economics of climate change policy has been growing in size each year. This this year it actually shot up tremendously. But that's anecdotal evidence. That's a sample size of one. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Navarra. Please share your thought about it. Uh, so how can uh, young people and science work together to tackle uh, climate change? Well, I, I, I of course, uh, share what uh, Robert just said. I have the same experience with my students. Uh, and uh, definitely there is a resurging interest in uh, climate change. I think it has two effects. One effect is actually to also generate more interest and enthusiasm for interdisciplinary studies. And uh, I think this has also created uh, an awareness that uh, the definition of the science and academic disciplines are somewhat uh, dated. I mean, most of them have been defined in the 19th century. And uh, I think there is, uh, there is a now a, a new understanding that there is a need to rethink and also to generate a flexible system by which uh, this uh, knowledge can be rearranged and uh, the expertise that are needed can be put together. So I think this is uh, in a way a secondary effect or if you want this is the main effect of the interest in climate change because you cannot understand climate change without extensive interdisciplinary interactions. So I think this is important. The other thing that I think the, the youth movement is creating is, I think they will contribute to a general reconstruction of social capital that has been destroyed in the past decades in the West by many mechanisms that have been very well documented. But the kind of um, activism, the kind of interest for cooperation and uh, discussion and joint action I think that not only has an impact on the issue at hand, but also it has an impact on the, as I said, the reconstruction of the social capital that I think is extremely important for a stable and, um, and um, progressing society. Thank you, Professor. So we have just a um, few, three minutes. So I'd like to ask, uh, uh, last question to Nizreen. So, how does the youth advisory group work to involve young people in the decision making process? Thank you very much for this question again. Uh, so the youth advisory group um, is something that young people requested during the climate adaptation, uh, sorry, climate action summit uh, in New York 2019, in September 2019. And it plays uh, the role of bridge between the secretary general and the young people itself. And also because we have a lot of access that other young people doesn't have. So we try to open other channels um, for young people to interact with their, for, for example, for their policy makers, decision makers within their countries and so on. And we also deliver the voices of the young people to the SG, um, uh, Antonio, Mr. Antonio Guterres and also backward. So we, we sometimes take um, messages from the secretary general to the young people it's, uh, themselves. We also try to have um, several consultations uh, on what young people admire or um, um, wish to see within this uh, movement of, of the climate change uh, activism uh, era and also we try to build their capacity and empower young people within the grassroots communities. Um, it's very important to have um, um, ground level activism, not only um, uh, higher level activism or policy level activism. That's why we are trying to do this bridge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nizrin. So uh, for the conclusion, I'd like to go back to Federico Boschieri. And I'd like you to, I, I'd like to ask you, what about uh, the, this debate? What about your experience? Thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank all panelists for their contributions, which were very relevant. Uh, I was particularly inspired by what Nizrin said. Uh, because I found myself very in line with her uh, feeling and description about the first participation at a COP. Uh, in my case, it was in, in Durban at COP17, and I had the very same feeling that uh, I was a bit overwhelmed uh, by people running around. And, uh, and, and that was the moment that I realized uh, how little I knew at the time about the process. And over in, in, uh, in the next 10 years leading to Glasgow, which 
uh, will probably be my my tenth cop. Uh, I understood how important it was to to build the experience and to share it. Uh, and this is the reason behind uh, the decision to write a book on the climate negotiations. I think there are a lot of young people worldwide, especially um, uh, those who have been engaging somehow on climate change matters, but also others who may wish to, to join this movement, uh, who may want to know more about the uh, multilateral process that uh, takes decision on the most important matters of our time and which will involve directly young and future generations. And uh, in, in this book, so my attempt is to, uh, is to explain how this process really works, uh, uh, what we can expect uh, from the future, and, and perhaps to, to, to explain uh, why it is important that every and each of us uh, support it for uh, the benefit of our uh, life on this planet. So thank you very much once again. Thank you, Federico. Thank you, Professor Navarra. Thank you, Professor Stevens. And thank you, Nisreen, for participating today. I'd like, you to thank, I'd like to thank you, everybody who is watching us on Instagram and LinkedIn and everybody uh, who is contributing to the chat and the questions. And I personally, I'd like you to thank um, I'd like to thank you, uh, NL Foundation and the British Embassy in Rome for having me. We, we focus on very important themes, such as the importance of climate negotiation to increase the level of ambition of global multilateral cooperation on climate. I hope the, that this webinar helped you to understand the importance of the engagement and empowerment of youth and uh, new generation to boost international actions uh, in view of uh, of uh, the pre-COP and COP26. Uh, so uh, now uh, it's up to you. So uh, let's go uh, and move uh, for the for a change, for a climate change. Thank you, everybody. Nice to uh, hope you to see you again.